Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through View 646. Today we're going to talk about claustrophobia 1643, and you wouldn't be able to tell that from the box cover because there's no words on it, although there are words on the side there. <laughs> this is a new edition of claustrophobia that came out, I think, 10, 9 or 10 years ago. And claustrophobia, just to kind of cut to the chase, is one of my all time favorite games. Uh, I never did a review of it, but I did talk quite a bit about it in my top 100 videos I did a couple years ago. This is a new edition. It has a lot of similarities to the base, to the original game. It has, definitely has some mechanical changes, some definite component changes, and some other kind of minor things. Uh, there, it, goes, it has a lot more scenarios than you got in the original. It has some of the same scenarios though. Uh, so let's jump down into how the game works if you're not familiar with the game. Uh, I'm gonna give you a quick run through. I will point out some of the key differences between this and the original and then I'll come back here and give you kind of my thoughts on it. So let me go ahead and do a quick kind of unboxing. I just wanted to do this because the presentation of the game is uh, they kind of went over the top a little bit on it so I figured I would go ahead and show you that. Uh, so let's just get this box cover off. Of course here we got the rule book, the scenario booklet. You can see here the number of scenarios. I didn't count them but there's definitely maybe twice as many in uh, this box as there is in the original game. And then you've got a couple other things here. So one cool thing here to show you is uh, as they come out with expansions and even some of the stuff that comes with this game, you can swap in and out. You have these sort of, I don't know what you call these, these are little like dashboards that can fold open and you can take a piece out and then swap it in with a new one here. And this is the main board for the adversary player. So one player is gonna be playing kind of the demons and the other one's gonna be playing the redeemer as well as some of their ex-convicts uh, that are trying, that have been sent down because they're ex-cons into these different uh, mines and places and catacombs to uh, fight back the demons. So you can swap these boards out. Now there's only this one main board for the demon character, but we'll look at some other stuff that's cool. Uh, of course, you've got your miniatures here. Now these are painted up and I painted these. They do not come pre-painted like the original did. You'll see these in a little bit more detail in a second. But you definitely get a lot more miniatures uh, in this than you did in the original. In the original, you just got these troglodytes, some of the heroes, and then kind of one daemon, uh, main demon that could be kind of swapped out for the different types of demons based on the scenario, but it was the same model. Now you have different models. And then you've got here, this is a troglodyte. Oh, that's in French. Everything is in French and English. So here you have a truff, tough troglodyte, and these are like beefed up troglodytes that can come out. You have these boards here, and I think these, these seem like they're a little bit bigger, but the artwork on the boards is really nice. You can see that there. So lots of cool things. And there's also like little terrain features and icons. So this will tell you, uh, you know, what this uh, you know, sort of game effect this terrain feature has on it. So it's a very abstract piece in some ways. It tells you how many uh, models from each side. So I could have three good guys and three bad guys on this piece, whereas some of these will not fit very many because they're tighter. So like this one, you can only have one on because it's a small, tight tunnel there. And these are numbered and so on. Sometimes you'll explore these from a face down stack and sometimes the scenario will tell you to set them up in a specific way. The backs of these kind of act as a turn tracker. There's a little marker here. So if a scenario is a certain number of rounds and you can track that here on the back of these. So everything is very efficient in this game. So we'll pull these boards out and there is a ton of different boards. You definitely get more boards in this than you did in the original. And then of course here we've got sets of cards here. These are French cards and English cards. And so I've kind of put them back to back here. So you've got different item cards that the scenario will tell you to start with certain of your heroes will get certain item cards. And then you've got some different event cards and skill cards for the good guys. And so we'll take a look at those more in detail. And then this is kind of a neat thing. You have these boxes here. So I've bagged up some of the cardboard components and put them in each of these boxes so they sit in there nice and aren't kind of flying around everywhere. Here you've got your combat dice in there. If we take a peek down here, we have our different little action dice. You have these hit point markers, which are these sort of red skulls. You can kind of see that. And then you have these uh, threat point uh, gems here that you're going to use for the demon player. And then again, we have these little dashboards here. So if we take a set these aside for just a second, and you can take a look at this guy. Here is your 
one of the guys you might use. This is a condemned brute. So in this case, you, each scenario will tell you which of the particular hero models to use. And then you slide this into here. And what you're going to be doing is rolling action dice and activating these different slots. So if you roll a five, you might assign a five to this guy or, or a different guy. And then they're going to get the stat line so they can move one space, roll two attack dice and have five defense. Or as you did here, you can move one space, three attack dice, four defense, and then you could actually draw one of your special skill cards. And then over here, depending on which demon that you're going to use, let's say you're using the Broodmother here, then you're going to slide this in here. And these, uh, have, these guys have all different kinds of powers and no, different numbers of hit points and so on. So you slide these in here and you can have places where you can now assign dice to them. Again, different special abilities and so on. You can swap these out. So here I just set out some tiles. I put a couple of the heroes out here and some of these troglodytes. Oh, let's find a cool looking demon here. He's kind of the big fella in the game. Uh, so we'll put him out there. And so the way that a turn works, you're going to get a scenario and it's going to give you uh, an objective for either side. And the scenarios are very different from each other. So like I said, sometimes you're exploring them. You might just start from one tile and then have to kind of explore out and draw them or it might give you a predefined map layout. It may give you special rules for different scenarios. And of course the different tiles will have different effects on the game. But the real sort of general gist of the game is that the good guy player is gonna roll four dice and assign these dice and then take actions with their characters. The other player is then going to roll at least three of these kind of demon activation dice uh, generate threat points and stuff like that and use those for special abilities and then go ahead and move and attack with their demons here So let's just take a quick look at how that kind of works So you're gonna have at the start of the game usually four of these different characters here So I'm gonna roll four dice one for each of them and then I'm gonna assign them So maybe I've got the condemned brute here. I'm gonna give him the one do I want to give him the five and so on and That's gonna change kind of their defense and their move and the number of attack dice. Do I get any cards? One thing about the Redeemer here is you can see these slots here. It's going to tell you kind of these different special bonuses. They've got little tokens for those. And they're going to start based on the scenario with different abilities. Each of these characters has different built-in abilities here. These icons will indicate what those are. Um, one thing I'll talk about in the review, if, if I forget to mention, I'll mention it now. It's really my only problem with the game is it should come with a player aid because there's just there's a fair bit of iconography between uh, this, the, the tiles here, on the board, these iconographies, and the different kind of things that the different daemon players can do. Uh, so it's not, not a ton. Like once you play it a couple times, you're gonna get into it. But it is a little bit overwhelming. You're kind of checking the rule book a whole bunch. Like, okay, we discovered this tile, what does that do? Oh, I forgot I have this guy, which is impressive. Or this one is guard or whatever, protection. And then, so it's like, oh, I could have used that last turn, but I forgot. So a little bit of that, your first couple of plays. A player aid, there is a nice player aid on Board Game Geek. Uh, and I know that there's some being developed now. Uh, that will help with that so you can go print those out, but that's kind of my only, only gripe So after you assign your dice to all the different characters Then you can go ahead and activate each of them and you either move and attack or attack and move the moving is pretty simple You can move the number of squares as long as there's an open pathway uh, To move based on what you assign because sometimes you get one or two movement based on what action die you selected And then of course you've got to obey the rules here So in this tile you can only have three of your heroes and three of the other side so I can move both these in here and I can get one more in there if I wanted. And then you're going to go in and attack and based on the attack value that you assigned, you're going to roll a different number of dice. So you're just going to roll that and then see if that is equal to or greater than the defense of your target. And if it is, they're going to take uh, a wound and these little troglodytes are all over the place for the whole game. One wound just kills them. And then of course the demon player will be bringing them right back. The different demon that's in play, there's only going to be one uh, demon, it's going to be change up based on scenario. They've got hit points to track on their board. Now, when the good guys take damage, they're going to have to assign a little damage marker to one of these spots. So maybe if I do that, I will assign that there. And now if I roll a one, if I'm forced for some reason to assign it to them, as this kind of fills up, you might not have a lot of choice as uh, characters move along and take damage. If I assign it to them, you're going to lay out a token here that will block out kind of everything that they can do. So they can move zero, fight zero, they have a defense of three, they can't use their special skills or items or powers or anything. So if you're ever forced to do that, then you're just gonna lay that token over there as a reminder for that round. However, over the course of the game, you can see you're gonna start drawing cards. 
and you're going to get a hand of cards. Your hand limit is the number of characters that are still alive. Uh, the characters can die as if they're forced to put, you know, damage and, they, and they're all filled up there. But you can use these cards for a variety of things. You either, either use them for kind of the special uh, ability of the card, or you can flip them up and then change the die that you were going to assign to that character. So at most, you can assign one card uh, per character in the dice assigning phase. You can say, okay, well, I'll, maybe I'll use this card on this other guy for the ability and change this guy's die and so on. So it gives you a way kind of to mitigate that. And it does play into some of the decision-making in terms of where you assign stuff, especially early on, because you want to get a hand of those cards to help you uh, with the luck of the roll as you take damage and all that. So after the good guys go, rolling dice, playing cards if they have any, and then moving and activating all of their characters. Then the demon player is going to go. And the demon player has this board here, which they always have. You can see it gives you the stats here for the troglodytes, tells you their move and their hit points and all that stuff, and these little red boxes. And then you may also have like some hellhounds. You might have the tough troglodytes there that you can add to your, your little army and different demons and stuff there. And so you're going to have this stuff in front of you. And you're always going to roll at least three of these black dice. If not more, there's some different triggers and stuff that will, you could probably get up to six of these dice. So you're going to roll three of them. And you have these kind of little kind of dice worker placement spots to put stuff. So to start the game, you're going to get a certain number of threat points. But you can generate more threat points in the game. And up here, you can see if you use all red or all white dice, you're going to get three threat points. So I rolled two white dice. So I might put these two up here and I would get six total. Uh, but you don't mix the colors there. If I put two white dice here, it doesn't matter the numbers in these cases, then I could get plus one movement uh, to my troglodytes there. If I do two red dice, which I don't have, then it gives them frenzied, which allows them to reroll misses on the attack. If you put any one die here, you get to draw cards out of this event deck and you have a hand limit of just straight four with these. And these will just do different things. Like it'll tell you when you can play them, uh, possibly while you're assigning dice or during combat, give you some cool special abilities, kind of mess with uh, the players. And then you've got two other spaces here. If you assign seven plus, doesn't matter the colors in this case, but it matters the numbers, then you can uh, bring in uh, monsters on this turn in places where there are characters. And in this one, you can actually ignore the entrances, which I'll explain in a second. But after you assign your dice, then you're going to spend these threat points to actually summon the different units. So these troglodytes here, these are always one, uh, one threat point. The, the, you have these hellhounds, which you can get. These here are three, you get two of these. They're not used in every scenario. And then the demon itself, you usually have one demon and then this will cost you five threat points. Now everything else except the demon, once you kill it, you can keep bringing it back. But if the player kills the demon twice, then the demon doesn't come back in the game. So you want to be, they're not all like super buff. I mean, they usually do crazy effects, but they're not all like super strong. Like some of them can die easy. So you got to be careful with that. So after you spend your threat, uh, kind of summoning them, then you can kind of act, move and activate them based on, you know, the movement and so on. And the fighting is the same. You just, you know, you roll the dice, you try to match or be greater than the defense of the player. But how does summoning uh, these work? Well, there's two basic rules which can be broken is that you have to summon here you know, on like an exit that goes off the edge of the board and you can't summon them where there is a player. So if it was like this, let's just move him out of the way. And for some reason we were split up like that. We can't bring any new demons in because both of these exits are blocked by the player. But again, if you have enough points in the dice to spend to break either of those rules, either you can bring them in on a side that doesn't have an, a natural exit, or you can bring them on right on top of the player if you do the intrepid charge. But th these are difficult to get because these are one, twos, and threes here, and they're different colored black and, or red and white. So you want to usually get more dice or be lucky or get some kind of card that allows you to change the dice and so on to maybe break that rule. Because sometimes, depending on the scenario, it's a easier or harder for the player there to kind of lock the demon player out once they kind of get set up and, you know, get going. You want to sort of uh, balance as the demon player, you know, how many points do you spend? Do you waste them? Do you kind of hold them back or, or you know, do whatever you want to do there to try to work around kind of the different objectives that are happening. 
And for example, one of the, if you summon if you summon an alarm here, then that will actually add more dice to the demon player. So that's kind of the gist of the different mechanics in the game. I'll give you a quick kind of uh, show and tell with some of the painted miniatures, and then we'll go to my review bit. So here's kind of the the main big demon. He kind of looks to me the most like the demon in the original game. You've got 11 of these troglodytes here, and you get two of these tr tough uh, troglodytes uh, there, which wasn't in the base game. Uh, and you also get these hellhounds, which if I remember right, were an, ex an expansion. You get two of these. And there's two different poses there. There's the other one. And you can see the bases here. These bases are like this. They're kind of cracked and everything built in there. So that's nothing I did other than paint them. So that's kind of nice. And here you've got the different heroes that come in the game. Here's the Redeemer. Usually you've got him and then a, sort of a combination of the rest of these. He's the one, like I said, that gets special powers. He can do a little bit of healing and so on, but you don't use them in every single uh, scenario. Here's a couple more of the different uh, demons that you can use in the game. I don't know, there's a lot of different uh, variety of different sculpts and things. I really like uh, these miniatures. I know one of the draws to the original game was they were pre-painted, uh, but I would definitely uh, recommend folks paint these. They're, they're really nice to paint. Here's a couple of more. I did a little bit different uh, style on some of these than the artwork showed, because some of the artwork is over-exaggerated. doesn't really give you like a painting guide. And you know, th these are supposed to be a certain color or anything. So this one's kind of ghostly. And then this one's more like a mummy than I think the original artist intended. But that's how I wanted to paint them. Uh, here's a couple of more, like I made this one a little bit more metallic, I think, than it was necessarily supposed to be. And this guy sort of painted with this strange uh, yellow, like really thin yellow paints on that one. And then here's the last three. I really liked uh, these three. They're kind of my favorite ones just because they're so weird and wacky. This guy's got kind of like a little bone face dancing tree guy thing with some real pale skin. Uh, this guy sort of... Uh, taken over this human, so it's all kind of bloody underneath there. And then, I don't know what this is, but it's sort of like a weird, uh, brightly colored bone fire thing. <laughs> I just had some fun with the colors on that guy. Um, the, like I said, the, the, the box and everything's really nice. This sort of plastic tray, everything fits really snug in there, so they're gonna be pretty well protected. Okay, so now we can go to the review. Okay, so that's Claustrophobia 1643. A little bit of a spoiler in the intro, I did mention it's one of my favorite games of all time, the original one. This is a definite improvement. Uh, before I get too far in, let's talk about kind of the three pillars of reviewing. Uh, one is player count. This is only a two-player game, which I totally forgot to mention at the very beginning of the review. So if you're brand new, you might have been a little lost. I just realized that <laughs> right as I was speaking. So yeah, it's, it's only a two-player game. You guys, you could play like one player... Uh, or two players on the good guy side and controlling two different characters or something if you really wanted to, but it's a two-player game. Uh, the play time is going to vary based on the scenario. Uh, you can take like a half an hour to maybe like a little over an hour based on what you're doing because sometimes you're going to be exploring for a while or it just might be a little bit more complicated with a lot of different rules and different, uh, you know, bigger map that you're going to go on. And sometimes it's going to be a very small, tight map with, you know, very quick turns, not a lot of... Uh, hemming and hawing about where to go and stuff, and just being very tactical within the sort of the confines of that scenario. So half an hour to a little over an hour. I could not see getting up to an hour and a half. So uh, that's the play time. And then in terms of uh, what is it like? Well, obviously it's like the base game or the original game. And it's, I would say for me, it, it is most like Hero Quest in a weird way, because uh, the way that I had the most fun playing Hero Quest, I had like basically two sessions of it. I got it when I was in college originally, and we played it a, f a few times. And then later on, uh, I had a temporary roommate for a little while, and he was like, hey, you have Hero Quest. This, is, this game's great, I've played through it a bunch. And so he actually played uh, as the, the dungeon master or whatever, and I played all four characters myself. And that was awesome, that was like the best. We played through the whole game, and it was fantastic. And so playing this really reminds me of that experience playing the Hero Quest, two players, you control four characters, and the other player's kind of playing the Overlord or whatever. Uh, there's not like a campaign here. You just kind of go in and pick a scenario and play it, uh, which I like. I, I don't really necessarily always need a big epic, you know, D&D style campaign. Uh, this really excels, I think, not doing that. Uh, so, you know, you could kind of compare this to like a Descent or something where, you know, you have the Overlord player and the other players playing it. 
or I don't know, but it's, it's kind of like a dungeon crawl, right? But the way that the mechanics and the scenarios and all that stuff is set up is the reason that it's one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, because it's really two different uh, puzzles for each player. And this is funny, it, it reminds me of a game called Santorini in that way, which is really on the surface nothing like this game. And Santorini is kind of a, a two-player puzzle, kind of abstract game. I did a review of it a long time ago. Go, go take a look at it. There's a bunch of reviews. And it's basically the same basic core game in, in Santorini, except you get special abilities, which really change up and break all the rules. This is similar. You've got the si two similar, uh, simple, I should say, mechanics. You roll all the dice, assign the dice to each hero, move and fight. Done. The... Demon player rolls three dice, maybe does some kind of worker placement action, spends their threat points, their kind of economy there, and then, you know, figures out how much they want to spend this turn versus what they hold back, and then move and fight their uh, different characters. And then the scenario then injects the asymmetry, if you will, even more. Uh, because each player will have a different goal or two kind of, you know, opposing goals that are the opposite of each other. And that's really going to change up how you approach the game in terms of, uh, you know, where I'm like leaving an opening for the demon player to come in and summon a bunch of guys, or do I spread them out, or do I, you know, go off of the chance that they're going to get this role and bring them in behind me and all this kind of thing. That really uh, kind of defines the game for me, is it's almost like playing uh, like a probability Euro or something, because you've got both sides are playing kind of worker placement with the dice. You get your dice, you roll them, and you got to figure out the smart way to to assign them. You're like, well, I don't want to assign this to this guy because, you know, he's only going to be able to move one. I really want him to move two. But if I don't assign this that same number to this other guy, then I won't be able to draw a card. You know, so he's got those, that real fine, small, discrete, small decision spaces within the course of the game. That is, it's, it's more like a Euro in that way than, you know, your typical Ameritrash game. And then you just kind of spin that on its axis of just kind of changing up little rules here and there from scenario to scenario. And the whole kind of game space and the decision space is really influenced a lot by the different special abilities on the tiles and whether you're exploring them and all that stuff. So the reason that I think this is, you know, significantly better than the original, I wouldn't say like light years better. So if you have the original and you still have it, I would not say necessarily you need to go out and seek this out. And I should say this is only a Kickstarter only game. And I kind of debated about reviewing it, but I've been kind of playing like a streak of not fun games for the last couple of weeks for some reason. Uh, so I was like, well, do I want to review Claustrophobia? Because you can't go out and buy it. You can't do it. But they are 100% coming out with Kickstarters to as long as they can meet the demand i think they're going to release this on kickstarter and the price point is definitely um reasonable for all the stuff you get in the box it's i can't remember exactly how much it was i think it was under 100 bucks or right at 100 bucks so you get all the cool miniatures you get the nice box all the nice crazy looking tiles and everything and so it's just a fix they don't mess around with stretch goals and all that stuff although they've said that they're going to come out with expansions at some point and you can see the game is easily plug and playable with those little like dashboard tray things uh, so you, you, if you watch this review, like, oh, I want to get it, but it's not out. Just kind of take a look at their, sub, or their Kickstarter or their website or kind of subscribe to some newsletter or something like that. Go seek it out. Subscribe to the BGG page for this game. It is going to be available, I think, relatively in short order sometime this year for sure, I think. Um, so, but back to my original point of if you've got the base game, do you want to chase this down? I would say it's better for a couple of reasons. One is the way that the, the player event deck thing works, where you can either play that as an ability or turn the card around and play it to change the dice. Uh, because that gives you a lot more ways to mitigate it. Uh, because, you know, the original, it could be punishing. It's a dice game still, right? So, but you could get in such a way where somebody could really horn in and beat up the good guy player and really take that guy out of the game really fast. That can still kind of happen, but you can still kind of get around it for a little while, maybe another turn or two. So that makes it a little bit more satisfying, I think for both players, honestly. So that because you have that kind of card draw, card play, kind of multi-use card thing, do I use it for the ability or whatever, or the dice change, that's really cool. That improves the, the hero player or the ex-convict player. 
On the flip side, I think there's even more of an improvement is the way that the uh, Demon player operates. Uh, their event deck is pretty much kind of the same as it was in the original game. The main Demon dashboard is a lot more refined and pared down. Uh, and it's a little bit more interesting the way the dice work. And the other one, it was kind of like playing Kingsburg. You had like different numbers and you can assign and split dice and, and stuff like that, or Alien Frontiers if you've played that, where you, where you roll the dice, you could split this and do this here, even numbers there, whatever, this and that. Uh, this is a little bit more interesting because you've got the different colored dice and they take away some of the spaces, but then they've added new spaces on all the different demons. And so that gives you sort of an interesting interplay between uh, you know, doing the activations that you want to do over here, maybe getting more threat points versus doing it, uh, activating some of the abilities on the demon itself. And so just being able to interchange and swap demons and, you know, the scenario rules are going to change up how the demons operate or, or they may say you can't use this space on your, your main demon board and so on. So they've really refined that and, and kind of streamlined the demon player, I think. And that I think is a lot better as well. So they've kind of improved both sides of the game. They've added a bunch more scenarios. And I don't really know, like let's say if you had the base, the original game and all the expansions, you probably have a little bit more content than what's in this box. But of course, they'll probably come out with expansions. Uh, the miniatures and stuff and the components are, are, are better. I mean, they were really good in the, in the original too. Um, but if, you, if you're not a painter, because I know when I first got the original, I was like, well, oh, cool, they're pre-painted, that's awesome. I wasn't painting then. Uh, so, but, you know, now that I'm painting, I'm like, well, that paint job wasn't that good. But for pre-paint, they were really nice. And so, but if you like to paint stuff, then obviously I think these are good quality miniatures, especially for, you know, that single mold, single shot plastic type miniatures. So definitely a high recommendation for me. I moved on my original uh, based on some of the early stuff that was coming out for this game. And it was like, okay, well, they have this new card ability for the good guy player. I know that's going to be better. So I just moved that original game on a long time ago and was really excited for this to come out. I definitely recommend this one. Uh, and if you don't have the original game, you might be able to find it for super cheap or something. Um, but, you know, that's, that's a budget decision, obviously. I think you'd still really have a good time with the original. I mean, I obviously did. Uh, but this one, maybe save up some money, I would say, if you really want to get into it. And this one will definitely be a better experience. There's a lot more replayability in here. Uh, you know, you can, I can't remember how, there's like 12, 13, 14 scenarios. And then even if you play each of them once, you're still only going to play them as, you know, one or the other player. You can just swap sides and then play it as the other one. So there's going to be like 30, some 40 games of this in. And definitely the scenarios are, some of them are quick enough that you can say, let's just play this one real quick. And we'll do, you know, remember last time we played that, we had such a good time, let's sit down and play it again. And you're not really going to have to like go through a lot of rules overhead or anything. And again, my only complaint, if you skipped right to the review and mixed the walkthrough, I mentioned it there, is it'd be cool if this came with a player aid. <laughs> I mean, that's my only complaint, really. Uh, because there's a lot of icons and things and special abilities and stuff. Seems like there's more in this than the, uh, than the original game for some reason. Uh, because you got the different icons on the players and obviously on the player on the the exploration tiles and then you've got the different tokens for the redeemer that you're going to use and then you know the special abilities on all the demons and stuff so there's a little bit of an overload there uh for your first couple of games but there is player aids on board game geek so it's kind of a nothing you can just go print those out uh, but that was my only kind of thing. I was like, ah, I could really use a player aid when I first sat down to play this again after ha not having played the original for a while. I was like, whoa. But, you know, then you adjust it and the iconography is good. It all kind of makes sense. You just look it up two seconds. Oh, yeah. But having it on an aid would have been nice. But whatever. That's my only complaint. Definitely take a look at this. And I think this is one that if you're not a dungeon crawl, a trash miniature player. And, uh, and this is what really drew me to the game when it first came out was this was like the dungeon crawl for people that like Euros. And at that time I was just all about Euros. And uh, yeah, I think give this a shot. Obviously, I don't know that I'd spend close to a hundred bucks on a Kickstarter if you're not sure, that's a big ask. But if you can find it or to try it out or anything, I think that a good chunk, a percentage of Euro players would 
like this. Not all of them, obviously, but I think there's a shot. If, if you kind of have that little bubbling in your belly, you're like, ooh, that looks kind of good. I like to smash some monsters in the face, you know. But you like euros in that kind of decision making. Take a definite, a close look at claustrophobia 1643. Okay, thanks.